Right, so this evening we're looking at enforcement of trust. Yesterday I introduced the concept of what a trust is and uh, basically how to express a trust. We looked at the fact that we're talking about private trusts, um, specifically rather than any other type of trusts, uh, such as a statutory or, or public trust. We don't um, really delve in those, that's more for the government and we don't want to have any third parties interfering in our private affairs. Uh, we also um, ended last night in how um, we would go about expressing the relationship. Uh, relationship was obviously very key to the heart of trust matters. Um, and hopefully if there's anything that you learned yesterday was uh, we need to define our relationships and be very aware and privy of our relationships um, in this commercial world in which we live. And we discussed yesterday uh, also as a recap about the, the trust scenario, um, we define the three uh, relationships or roles of a trust, which is the set law, which is the, the beneficiary, and also the trustee. Um, and we look briefly at the roles of each party, the set law, the trustee, and the beneficiary. The set law is the creator of the trust. Uh, he's the one that puts property into trust. Um, and we call that property the res, okay? Um, and then uh, he assigns a trustee, um, it could be himself or uh, another party, to men maintain and administrate the property uh, for the benefit of the beneficiary, and the beneficiary enjoys the use of that property. So um, that was what we looked at yesterday very briefly. I also uh, really discussed um, in detail as to the, uh, the basic historical developments which we're going to go into a lot more this evening. Uh, we also broke down uh, in, in no uncertain terms that you are the set law. The set law is the real man. The set law is the creator. Uh, the set law has the power, holds the keys, um, and he writes the law. It's his law in that trust when he declares the trust um, or makes a declaration of trust it's his law or her law which as he is the king and it's the king who makes a declaration uh, what he says goes as far as that trust is concerned and it's for us to understand our role as a set law and to really embrace the concept in our minds uh, that pretty much we can do what we want to do um, and say what we want to say and see it done um, and expect that the office of trustee shall be carried out so tonight we're going to look at enforcement um, and the big question is, well, what, what, what is enforcement? Uh, you know, we've looked at trust, which is fine. Um, but what's enforcement? How, what, what's the big deal? Uh, the only way I can really explain enforcement um, in the very basic uh, terms is um, compelling those who are in charge or responsible for the trust to perform. If they fail to perform or they're, they're lacking in their duty, then uh, someone has to enforce or compel uh, the trust to perform. And so it's really looking a lot deeper into um, the law of trusts. And I will be introducing to you um, the uh, jurisdiction, a different jurisdiction of law or body of law called equity. Has anyone heard of the term before? Equity. If just type in a Y on your keyboard, that'd be awesome. Or if no, if you haven't, that's, that's not a problem, just to help me gauge uh, where the group's at. So uh, we're looking at equity. Um, this evening, I'm going to introduce that as a concept um, and as another distinct body of law for so people understand where we're coming from. Um, okay, so brilliant, we've got some decent responses there. That's fine. So I'm going to break that down for you. I also want to look at um, if uh, statutes and acts um, pertain to what we call as the common law, and uh, don't get confused when I say common law now, please don't get confused with the old English type of common law. Uh, when we refer to the common law, I'm talking about the law of the land as it is today. What is the law in place? The common law in place. 
which is governed by statutes and acts and admiralty uh, maybe you know 100 to 100 years ago or even longer than that uh, we had english common law which is fine um which is obviously not the same as statutes and acts uh, but today when i say the common law i'm just talking about what is the law in place today and we refer to that as the common law all right does everyone understand what i'm saying there just so that uh, there's no confusion now so i'm saying if statutes and acts pertain to common law then um maxims pertain to equity so we're going to introduce enforcement um, I can't obviously go into it in too much depth this evening there's, there's so much to it but hopefully by the time we finish this evening you'd have a, a, a more of a, a gist of what it's all about uh, so introduction to equity and enforcement enforcement now I'm going to be doing a bit of reading this evening from various texts because um, as I always say I don't like to have uh, things in the words of, of Richard uh, unless I'm trying to explain or, or, or uh, define something um, I prefer to let the definitions preferably come out of uh, the so-called or preferably horse's mouth so um, I'm going to be reading uh, first of all uh, a, a transcript from a, a judge his name was Lord Justice Turner and it was a case called Milroy versus Lord a very famous case in, in the Chancery and Equity Circles um, but I just wanted to give you an, an idea because some people may ask the question well you know you might go to court or maybe challenged by somebody say well you know we don't accept a trust as a form of payment um, and you need to be aware of your rights to say well it's every man's right to, to form a trust so um, I'm going to read out a trans uh, just a, a, the transcript from this uh, this famous case and we're going to get started from from this basis um, and it's everything to do with private express trust which is awesome um, so Milroy versus Lord it says in order to render a voluntary settlement and all that is is just a payment in other words uh, uh, to, in order to render a voluntary settlement valid and effectual the settler must have done everything which according to the nature of the property comprised in the settlement was necessary to be done in order to transfer the property and render the settlement binding upon him he may of course do this by actually transferring the property to the persons for whom he intends to provide and the provision will be then effectual so in other words just as you go to Tesco's every day you can just transfer the money straight away um, to the cashier so you have every right to do that so it's a direct uh, settlement as he says here or, or actual transfer um, of property to the persons for whom he intends to provide and this is that that provision will then be effectual or made real and this is and it will be equally effectual if he transfers the property to a trustee for the purposes of the settlement or declares that he himself holds it in trust for these for those purposes and if the property be personal the trust may as I apprehend be declared either in writing or by parole which is verbal but in order to render the settlement binding one or other of these modes must as I understand the law of this court be resorted to for there is no equity in this court to perfect an imperfect gift and the cases go further to this context that if the settlement is intended to be effectuated by one of the modes to which I have referred the court will give effect to it by applying um, another of those modes okay if it is intended to take effect by transfer the court will not hold the intended transfer to operate as a declaration of trust for then every imperfect instrument would be made effectual by being converted into a perfect trust now let me just break that down if it sounded a bit too um, uh, techy and uh, legal jargon effectively what Lord Justice um, uh, Turner was saying is that every man woman uh, has the right to either make a, a, a settlement uh, directly i.e. just call it a straightforward payment as we do at the moment all right or he can make a settlement by way of a trust okay in other words 
you can declare yourself to be trustee um, or you could assign someone else to be a trustee as a settler all right um, for someone else's benefit you have every right to do that you have a choice so that don't let anybody tell you having this is a, a, a law of justice now from the senior courts in well-known case law stating that every man has the right to either make a, a payment in trust or directly I hope everyone understands that now he went on to say that if it's not done properly um, then equity can't come to your aid because it doesn't look at imperfect gifts to be equal to a trust in any way shape or form so now even though yesterday I, I um, basically and it is true it's, it's trust law that um, parties in the trust need not know that they're involved in the trust it's still important to make sure that whatever property you are depositing into trust as a set law as the one who creates okay and disposes of property must create the trust properly there is a set procedure now I'm going to introduce this concept um, before I go into enforcement in any, any more detail because if you don't if, if you can't prove a trust you have none I repeat if you are unable to prove a trust exists as a set law of a private trust you do not have a trust I'm gonna say it one more time I'm not for not lacking of words to, to, to say I'm not repeating myself for boredom I'm trying to dig this deep into your into the fibers of your your being into your memory if anything you can write it on the inside of your eyelids if you do not have or if you're not able to prove a trust you have none and if you have no trust then the game's over all right you cannot allow fair parties to have discretion on your private affairs you cannot allow uh, courts judges uh, or any other fair party to get involved in your private affairs and mess up your plans um, because it could be disastrous for you so you have to make sure you do things properly all right now the case that I quoted was Milroy versus uh, Lord Milroy versus Lord okay that's 1862 this case Milroy versus Lord just google it all right there's, and there's lots there's plenty of cases like this that backs up everything I'm saying to you this evening um, so we're just introducing uh, enforcement so I'm saying first of all if you have no trust if you can't prove trust you, you have none all right if you're unable to prove a trust you have none and I'm sorry to repeat myself but it is actually vit it's vitally important I'll write it down if you are unable to prove a trust you have none so it bears now the question or the questions now deserve to be asked how do I prove a trust so you may have I may have mentioned just so you may have heard me mention yesterday that there are certain rules um, that we need to adopt now um, for those who you know learn from from our brothers over the, 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 the pond so to speak in the USA um, they have different ways of proving a trust which will not hold water in this country so you have to understand the UK law and how the, the, the courts um, operate uh, to prove a trust and then you apply it for your own private person private affairs for your tr private trust so UK law um, have uh, a very powerful rule and it's called um, you may have heard of it before the rule of certainties okay now I'm going to read something else to you now from another uh, um, judge regarding the trust and proving the trust so we're gonna spare me one second basically the rule of three certainties I'm just gonna write it down and I'll get the text to read for you number one you must have what we call certainty of intention 
which I'm going to explain shortly. Number two, certainty of objects. Has anyone heard of all this before or is this new to you? I, I don't know if, if I'm preaching to the converted or if this is uh, something that is completely new. Um, and then number three, certainty of subject matter. All right, now these, this is vitally important. So let me read this out to you now. Just spare me two seconds. I'm just going to get, uh, I'm just going to read it out to you so you can see. Now, the judge, um, the, the famous case is night versus night. And I'm going to read it out for you now. It says that to create a valid trust, I'm reading here from the book I mentioned yesterday, which is by Professor Alastair Hudson, Equity and Trust, 6th edition. That's Alastair Hudson, Equity and Trusts. Um, I'll just repeat because apparently the sound went. Um, the book that I'm reading from is from Alastair Hudson, Professor Alastair Hudson, uh, Equity and Trusts, okay, 6th edition. Um, the main principles underlying this area of law are as follows, okay? This is certainty in creation of express trust, which is what we're dealing with in the private. So, to create a valid trust, the terms of the trust of that trust must be sufficiently certain. There are three forms of certainty which the courts require. There's certainty of intention to create a trust, certainty of, ident of, the, of the identity of the subject matter comprising the trust fund and certainty of the beneficiaries or the objects of the trust or power in question. Now, A, the settler's intention to create a trust as opposed to something else must be clear. The settler's intention to create a trust must be clear. All right, I, I have to really emphasize this. You cannot be in two modes of thinking when you're about to express a trust else they'll see right through you and they'll, they'll give them the right to discern your private affairs. You, you have to make sure your certainty or your, of your intentions are extremely uh, exact and deliberate, okay? So I'll, I'll read it again. The set law's intention to create a trust as opposed to something else must be clear. There is no requirement to use a specific form of words when dealing with trust over property, all right? Other than land, there's a specific way to deal with land. But everything else, there's no particular words you must use. The court will be prepared to infer an intention to create a trust from the circumstances and the party's conduct. The court will be prepared to infer intention to create a trust from the circumstances and the party's conduct. B. The trust fund must be identifiable. The trust fund, the res, must be identifiable. A trust in which the trust property is mixed with other property so that it is impossible to identify precisely which property is held on trust will be invalid. Do not commingle your trust funds, okay? Keep your relationships specific, certain, and special. Do not commingle, all right? Well, we, which we um, talked about yesterday. The trust fund must be a, a, a special form, uh, must be set apart, specific for its that use and for that purpose and that, and that alone. So in other words, don't mix your apples with your oranges. All right? Uh, it says here that, uh, um, how, is this how, how, however, ex exceptionally, it may be that where the property is intangible property, that's one that you cannot touch, taste or feel, so where the property is intangible property made up of identical units such as ordinary shares of the same class, for example, it may not be necessary to segregate the trust property from other property. I'll explain that shortly. This exception is doubted by many academics. And C, it says that to identify the beneficiaries, it is first necessary to identify the nature of the power which is being exercised in relation to fiduciary mere powers and in relation to discretionary trust. Uh, it is required that it is possible to say of any person claiming to be a beneficiary that that person is or is not a member of the class of beneficiaries. Some exceptional cases have taken the view that the trust may be valid where it is possible to say that a substantial number of people do or do not um, 
fall within the class of beneficiaries, which I'll explain that shortly. So let me break the, let me let me break it down for you in further capacity. I'm going to read something else here for you. Um, three certainties. It says here that English law has a great affection for certainty. All right, judges are concerned that the law promotes certainty in contracts, trust, and other dealings between persons. In terms of the trust specifically, the judge's concern is that the set law makes her intention sufficiently uh, certain. All right, the set law makes her intention sufficiently certain so that the court will be able to direct the trustees how to act if there are problems with the administration of the trust. Now, I'm not too concerned about the court in that respect, but my, the, try, the point I'm trying to highlight is you must be very clear. So we're going to um, just show you a, a, a kind of a brief overview of how we would express certainty. Now, um, so in terms of intention, in terms of objects, and also in terms of your, um, where are we, subject matter. Now, let me explain let me explain this in further details. Your intent is very important. When we were talking about yesterday about um, trust being construed, remember that word, all right, constructive trust. It's pretty much pretty much is what happening is happening against you at the moment. So a relationship uh, has been inferred or construed then um, effectively what is going on as far as you're aware or as far as I'm aware is that you, you that, that someone's acting in the capacity of unconscious well, let me start again they're not being honest unconscionability all right they are not being honest there's lack of integrity so because of this if you're going to be the set law your intent has to be very very specific indeed so when we express a trust you're going to have to prove or cover your tracks to show that you were you had every intention to create a trust in the first place all right uh, now as a question here please validate what you mean by co-mingling i think i might have answered the question but just to to, to clarify that if i haven't answered it yet um yesterday i, I mentioned very briefly about the, the co-mingle so if you have a, a general bank account all right a general bank account you would be paying your gas you'll be paying your electricity um, you know your rent or mortgage or whatever it is pretty much everything comes out of this one account generally okay whereas if you have say a um, a special a special account for number one number one Acacia Avenue All right, so basically, and only only to cover for um, damage to that house, for example, then the only monies that would be in that bank account um, would be uh, a, a fund to pay for damages. So if you were low on cash and decided that you're going to dip into this special fund to do the shopping you violated the special account terms so in other words there's a co-mingle because you're using it for other purposes besides its specific one to cover damages to this special property all right so i don't know if i explained so if it's not special if it's not dedicated then it's general and if it's general then it's a there's, there's a co-mingle taking place all right there's lots of things happening so it can't be used for the purposes of the trust because it's not identifiable. It's, it's not identifiable. It's not specific. All right. So I hope I explained that enough there. So another question is: I may be a, a, the only one, but I understand that you're saying regarding the trust. Um, 
up to a point, but where I'm, I'm confused is someone, if someone does not know they are in a trust, why am I creating one? Well, at the point, but right now I'm trying to tell you is that you're in a trust relationship and you, you've never known it until now. But trust, creation, trust relationships are being made against you all the time. And they don't have to tell you that you're in a trust relationship because the law of trust states that no one needs, no party needs to know they're in a trust relationship. All right. So if you flip it on its script, obviously, if you're going to create a trust for it's for the purpose of um, settling or extinguishing debts, then yes, certain parties will need to know that they're in a trust relationship. That's fair enough because you are now expressing the relationship rather than um, making the relationship one of, of a constructive nature which is an act of fiction it's in their world all right so now you know that they don't have to tell you that you're in a trust relationship it's your responsibility to have your trust eyes opened to see when they're trying to construe a relationship which is not going to be positive or conducive for your benefit so that's why i'm trying to make the point out that no one needs to know no party needs to be aware that they're in a trust it also may be a situation where you have correctly expressed a trust and the trustees are saying, well, I've never, I've never received any documentation. I don't agree to be a trustee. Well, that's, that's their problem. You, if you did everything correctly and you can prove it, whether they receive the paperwork or not doesn't negate the fact that they're trustees. It doesn't negate the fact that a trust is in place because the law of trust says that the parties don't need to know. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do what you're supposed to do. So it's, two, it's a twofold argument. All right. So if I have a dozen properties, what would I need? To, uh, would I need to do a dozen trust funds? It depends on what is the overall intention. That's the point. It depends on what your intention is to do. What is what is the purpose of the trust in the first place? Now, normally we just say because this is just covering the basics of enforcement. But normally your intention is always to create a trust. Uh, for the benefit of the beneficiaries. I mean, pretty much you've covered every angle there. However, to answer your question, um, if you have one big portfolio with 12 properties, uh, with one bank account, yeah, with all rent going into one bank account, and you assign a trustee to manage just those 12 properties with the one fund, with the one bank account, and as long as you can prove, or the trustee can prove, that he hasn't dipped into it to cover his shopping um, in Tesco's for his girlfriend, or something like that, that violates the trust declaration that you're going to make, then yes, you can have all 12 properties in one trust. That's not a problem, as long as it's specific, special, um, and peculiar. But it may be something a bit more pedantic that you want to get sorted out where it has to be done on, on a per property basis. So it just depends on what, is, what it is you're trying to do effectively. All right. I hope that answers that question and I hope everyone's, um, I don't know if that's answered your question, Lawrence, but hopefully that should be okay. So um, getting back now to, to certainty of intentions so we can move on. Um, with, if you're, as a set law, when you declare, make sure you state that you just just make it so that no one can argue with you. You have an intention, and that's to create a trust. And you're creating a trust to benefit the beneficiaries. All right. Now we're going to case law and all that stuff on the course. That's fine. Um, which supports your argument. We're going to the structures of what we do, um, like creating memorandums and deeds and such and such so on and so forth in order to establish your intention without any shadow of a doubt that the law cannot construe something else so we use um, the principle of notices uh, to notice the parties to make them aware of their well not to make them aware of their rights but to make them aware that they have rights and it's for them to go and find out what their rights are but the fact that you've noticed them you're acting in a uh, an equitable um, fashion and so you're doing the right thing all right so that's the certainty of intention um, and there's case law to support that. There's also, when we talk about the certainty of subject matter, um, it's, the subject matter is a res, and you have to make sure that 
certain rules have been complied with, all right, so essentially your subject matter, which is the res, the property. Now, the, the basic things you need to understand about that is, again, I've been harping on about it for last, from yesterday and today, it must be um, have a special use, all right, for a singular purpose normally, right, F solely for the trust itself, all right, not, uh, uh, and, it, and it has to be deposited into the trust. So, in other words, um, you can't have, um, there must be proof of delivery. There must be acknowledgement in one way, shape or form. Okay, of receipt um, for the use of trust. Now, uh, the, the basis of that would be, for example, um, if I have a pen and I say, um, you know, Nana, hold this pen for me, please. And if, uh, if my son asks, that, you know, if my son ever needs a pen, um, I'm going to send him to you and you'll just let him use that pen. Um, here's some cash, so if the ink runs out, just buy, you know, refill the, refill the ink and then allow my son to use the pen whenever he wants to. I've just expressed the trust. Nana's a trustee. My son's a beneficiary. Uh, and I said that the pen is the res. But now I've got to be a bit more pedantic about it. Cause it's not just any old pen. Let's say that this pen happens to be a pen um, with the brand called Edding. Um, and let's just say it has a, a serial number, um, X5123. Okay? Um, and it happens to be uh, the color green. All right? So now I've made it very specific. Uh, so therefore, if anyone tries to swap it around, um, then the title number would have been different. Uh, something would have changed. Maybe the quality and class of ink would have been different, etc. So therefore, there's no certainty of subject matter. But now I've expressed quite clearly the, the pen. Um, then it's in trust. The trust has its use. The trust knows the title number of that, of that property. The, the value, the amount, and the, its usage, and when you declare it as a set law, obviously you're going to have other bits and pieces involved as well. Okay, so um, who must be, who must it by, be acknowledged by, um, who must provide a receipt? Uh, the trustees are the ones who need to be in receipt of it. Now, um, there's different ways that we'll teach you in terms of proving receipt of it or proving delivery. Um, that, but effectively it must be done so okay now in every, in, in, the main thing is the, the for a trust to be constituted for a trust to be alive um or vested in other words then um the, the set law must do his job and transfer physically transfer property in the hands of the trustee when it's in the hands of the trustee then if effectively the property is in trust all right so an acknowledgement could just be a declaration by you saying that you have done this on such and such a date. It could be the fact that you use special delivery services. And by the way, special, the word special delivery is private. Okay, so it's very important you understand that. Whereas recorded, it's a general. So you you may want to be saying that your instruments are using special delivery. You've got a tracking number. Um, you can track the fact that it's been signed for and received, and then that is uh, general. Uh, no, sorry, that's decent enough evidence to prove that it's been delivered. In other words, it's left your hands, and someone else is in receipt of it, um, and it's be, uh, been identified that they're in receipt of it. Okay, um, isn't proof of delivery and not receive the same thing? Exactly, that's right. So that's that's what we're trying to say. So once that we've once that's happened, then you know the trust is now vested. You may want to use other um, means of, of uh, expressing that by way of public notice um, and other means that we teach on the course that makes it watertight that the trust is in place and no one can argue with you um, in, in any, any way, shape or form because you've done what you're supposed to do and you've covered your tracks along the way, especially because you're expressing the trust. 
um, there's no room for for manoeuvre. There's no room for 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 um, second guessing your your actions. So that's vitally important. And then obviously for certainty of of um, objects, then yes, the beneficiaries must be named. And the capacity in which they, they they operate. So if it's that they they must enjoy the they have full full use of the property. So just like yesterday we talked about um, uh, the queen, um, you know, allows her son to use the the, the 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 phantom roller. That's perfectly fine. Now obviously all of the peculiar parts of the phantom roller, like the VIN number, the colour, uh, the date of registration, etc., would have been uh, documented in her declaration of trust. Which is fair enough, um, but in terms of the powers of the beneficiary, she would say, "Well, my son has the right to use it any time he wants to. Um, he does not have to pay any bills towards it. He does not have to pay any petrol fees, etc. He only has full use and to to drive the car. So, therefore, that's the powers now being uh, uh, defined. And then the trustees' powers would also be defined in your trust document when you declare. And that's all it is. And then, therefore, you can prove." using those free rules and you'd have case law to support all of that etc there's no time to go into all of that tonight so we'll be here um for many hours but you know we go through that in my well in very um fine detail on the course so that you are armed with tools to now when you have to go in the litigation process uh prove the trust exists and pretty much once you've got the rules of free certainties you're there you prove the trust and once you prove the trust it's downhill because once a trust exists, the argument now flips not to, well, have you paid or not, but, well, why have the trustees not paid? And so the argument now is the trustees are in breach as opposed to you have not fulfilled your duty. Because if I go back to how I started off with what Lord Justice Turner says, every man has the right to make a, a settlement in trust or uh, directly. And so if you've done it in trust and you can prove the trust exists, then you have paid as far as you're concerned. Or in other words, the trust should have made the payment on your behalf as a beneficiary so that's the argument and they can't argue with you because you've got their laws telling you the, the rules so that they can't be saying to you well now this is an american thing or there's no uh if they write to you saying there's no legal basis they're absolutely correct there is no legal basis you're operating from the jurisprudence of law or equity now as we say so then we're going to move sharply into enforcement so is there any questions around that? Is there any confusion around that? Or um, what if the trustee returns the res to the set law? Uh, it doesn't matter. If, if a trustee decides that he wants to return the res and you've done everything else that you're supposed to do, because, as I said, um, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Now, this is a, a, a general context, but effectively... Um, a trustee has to disclaim and if he doesn't ex disclaim he has accepted now it depends on who you've assigned to be the trustee for starters you've got, you've got to choose your trustees wisely if you're just going to choose some Joe Blogs off the street then yeah he can say no I don't want to be a trustee and he can return the goods so you may have to find a different trustee. But the way we teach, we're going to find trustees who cannot disclaim. They cannot do so. That's, that's, it's against their their um, their job description. And they, and that's something that you, you're going to use to your advantage. Um, the trust that I've expressed, I've not had anyone return any documents back to me before. Um, so if it's done properly, then I don't see why they should be sending it. Unless the trustees that we've nominated are not competent to do so because they're telling you they're not, they're not competent to operate as a trustee which may be the right thing in certain capacity so you find somebody else to do the job simple um uh, is there a time scale within which proof of trust proof of transfer by public notice must be made um well yesterday when we talked about the notice of interest and the statement of interest uh Typically, I'd say within 14 to 21 days, if you we're make, making a notice of interest, i.e., some that you 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 for example, just to recap about the, the notice of interest, um, 
you have full rights and titles to the Phantom Roller, okay? Full rights, title and interest to the Phantom Roller. So that's your NOI or your, your notice of interest. Now you could make action immediately if you don't hear something, you could give it 14 days. I would say no longer than 21 days before you have to then prove your allegation. Yeah, uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, is there time, right, can you give an example of a trustee you have nominated? Uh, solicitors make good trustees and they hate receiving these documents. Right, so always have a solicitor. They're the ones who's trying to make her life a misery, a, a misery. so um, give them a taste of their own medicine. Um, they don't understand equity, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes. Um, and by law, they can't disclaim. By, by default, they're public trustees. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's that typically you'd use solicitors um, amongst others. Yeah? So, I hope that answers the question. So, we're going to move on now to... So, we basically, you, you, that's how we prove a trust and um, using the rules of certainty. Uh, if proof of transfer is done within 21 days, say privately to the trustee, but not publicly, would this be a pro would this be problematic? Um, okay, we teach about in the course about the doctrine of notice. There's different types of notice. There's actual notice. Uh, there's implied notice. And then there's constructive notice. So from what the question you've asked me, you would have fulfilled one of these three. And all one of and any of these three are perfectly fine. Depending on what you've done. But pretty much actual notice is you directly notice them. Implied notice means well if uh, you're talking to Joe Bloggs and Joe Bloggs nominates a solicitor called um you know Bills and Co. And you've you sent Bills and Co. a notice. Well, by implication, Joe Bloggs has been noticed as well. All right. And then constructive notice uh, would be like a public notice. It's it's been construed that the fact that I've noticed the public, so well, you should be aware. So you, your question, one of the three would have been satisfied. I try to make sure we fulfil at least two of the three in in our processes. All right. Um, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. Uh, just regarding the doctrine of notice, is a, a, a well-known case called uh, Barclays Bank versus O'Brien, um, and Lord Brown Wilkinson uh, says that that the doctrine of notice is at the heart of equity, in that notice of or in terms of constructive trust, knowledge of, another's rights will preclude a defendant from seeking to defeat that person's rights. Yeah, um, so I'll read it again. Um, let me just try and find a, a better yeah so it says there um, so Barclays Bank versus O'Brien uh, it's a case concerning the rights of co-owners to set aside mortgages examined later in this chapter which I'm reading from the same book um, from Alistair Hudson it says in that decision Lord Brown Wilkinson asserted that the doctrine of notice is at the heart of equity in that notice of um, another's rights will preclude a defendant okay from seeking to defeat that person's rights all right so um, in other words it, once you've noticed someone some if once you've noticed somebody of that they have rights you can't use a defense that you, you're ignorant of what's going on but judges, solicitors, the whole lot will try to trick you and say, well, just because you notice someone doesn't mean they have to do it. Well, you're absolutely right. But you, you have noticed them and they have the right to find out what their rights are. And if they fail to do so, then they have waived their rights full stop. 
ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's as simple as that. You don't have to tell them what their rights are. You just need to let them know that they have rights and it may be of their interest to go and find out what they need to go and do. Okay? So, but a lot of a lot, that, you know, is gone. You know, we deal with, it's a two-day course, the basic one anyway, um, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So you can imagine there's a lot of stuff we have to go through over two days and, and we cover it in, in a lot of... A lot of uh, detail okay so let's move on um uh, hopefully that's answered all the questions now um right so i'm going to read some information here about equity and common law because this is a good precursor to build up for enforcement of your trust now you can prove a trust you can enforce it all right, so it's vitally important to understand um, that proving a trust is vitally important. You're creating one, yep. Yeah. Uh, so do it in a way that you can prove it. Always start with the end in mind. That, you know, as, as I was taught, you start with te step ten before you start step one. Um, just know how to play the, how to fight. So um, I want to read some text here. This is from Gary Watts' book, Equity and Trust. Um, Gary Watt, I think, is a, probably one of the strongest proponents of equity that I've uh, come across in a long time. Um, and I'll just, uh, he starts off with um, a biblical quote. He says here that, Then shalt thou understand righteousness um, and judgment and equity. And well, that's from the book of Proverbs 2, um, verse 9. But he says here, The term equity can be used to describe a form of social fairness or a branch of morality or even an aspect of divine justice. But in the context of modern legal studies, the term equity connotes the law's internal capacity to depart from its general rules in the interest of better justice in particular cases. Okay? English lawyers have largely succeeded in their efforts to turn equity into something as regular and as general as law, but it still remain, retains a flavour of its non-legal origins. So when we use the word legal, please don't confuse that to be lawful. They're, they're two complete distinct different words. Okay, legality is not lawfulness. All right, legality could be something doing complete something doing something completely immoral and incorrect, but it's still legally right. Doesn't make it morally correct. Right, where lawfulness operates in morality. Yeah, the best way for me to put it is, uh, legality looks at the letter of the law, whereas lawfulness looks at the spirit of the law, the heart of your intentions. So, was someone acting unconscionably towards you? And the definition of unconscionability is if I go to the shop and I buy a suite or an item that costs ten pounds, and I give, um, I give, I give it, I, I give uh, twenty pounds, expecting change, okay, and the, the the shopkeeper gives me my ten pounds and I leave, then that's fine. If he gives me twenty pounds by mistake, and I leave. And I realise that I've got, I've just pocketed an extra ten pounds. If I don't go back to that shop and say, "Sorry, mate, um, you gave me ten pounds extra money," who has who's acted unconscionably? Who has acted with an immoral attitude towards the shopkeeper? Can anyone just type the answer for me, please? If you did, you understand the the question? Right, I have acted unconscionably. Yeah, towards a shopkeeper because I have knowingly pocketed an extra ten pounds, and I have not gone back, and I have decided not to give it back to him. So I've acted unconscionably. In other words, it's not a natural act to be deceptive. Yeah, I've not acted conscious consciously towards this person. I've acted unconscionably. All right, it's deceptive. All right, so the one who keeps the twenty quid is acted unconscionably. So you can see now that most of your relationships in this debt commercial world especially how uh, money creation and all that stuff, has been unconscionably towards you. I don't know if you can agree with that or not. All right? And we're, because we're in a fiction, it's all unconscionability. So equity will correct that. But you have to build your case. All right? So this is where we're, we're driving towards now. We're to, to enforce means you have to prove unconscionable nature towards you. An unconscionable character has taken place 
yeah, and unconscionable conduct has taken place towards you, and you have to now correct that record, right? But you have to prove it because he who makes a claim must also prove, which we'll discuss more about tomorrow. But to, to, so to enforce, so we're going to go into it in more details now. So I'm going to start here. So it says, the major means by which equity in law maintains a connection with its legal origins is the language of unconscionability. Equity in law is still concerned to prevent unconscionable assertion of general rights and powers. I repeat, this is a law book I'm reading, by the way. Okay, so it says, equity in law is still concerned to prevent unconscionable assertion of general legal rights and powers. It's there to prevent it from happening. All right. In other words, where justice actually takes place. The word unconscionable has lost its connection to morality and the courts try to use it as, a, as precisely as possible in ways which vary from context to context. But it reminds us of equity's ecclesiastic origins, okay, biblical origins, and reminds us that equity is a broader idea than the quite narrow legal version of the concept might suggest. Language such as unconscionability sits somewhat uncomfortably in modern law, but that it is a good thing for keeping the law realistically and appropriately humble about its capacity to cover every possible case by means of general rules. The language of unconscionability, unconscionability is highly effective at keeping the general rules open to just exceptions um, in particular cases and in particular kinds of case. A brief overview of the history is essential to understanding the modern law of equity and trust. We will see that elements of equity in English law can be traced um, b as far back as uh, Aristotle. But now it will, uh, it will suffice to say that the legal idea of equity was developed in England in the Middle Ages by a senior clergyman called a Chancellor, who originally acted as the King's private counsellor. Okay? His task was to ensure the general common law, which was enforced in the king's name, okay, and that was applied with justice in individual cases. Equity was therefore a way of exercising a royal prerogative of mercy, which was designed to ensure that, that the king's conscience was clear before God. The chancellor eventually became the head of his own court, known as the Court of Chancery, as we know it today. And it was here that equity developed as a branch of law distinct from, and at times in competition with, the common law. I will repeat that for you, okay? The Chancellor eventually became the head of his own court, known as the Court of Chancery. And it was here that equity developed, um, equity developed as a branch of law distinctively, right, distinct from and at times in competition with common law. I hope bells, alarm bells are started to ring here. You, you, there are two branches of law and most people only know about one, okay? You've got the common law, which is attacking you, trying to rob you, taking away your goods, okay? It's what we call in rem proceedings. In other words, it's, it's always attaching things attaching itself to your things and not to you, all right? And then you have what we call uh, chancery, which is the, the, the jurisprudence or the, 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 the body of law which governs equity in the UK courts, all right? Which deals with the person directly. The trustee who doesn't perform can effectively be in contempt of court and go to prison. All right, so you need to understand how powerful trusts are. Uh, what does the word equity mean? It cannot mean trust if the book is called Equity and Trust. Equity is fairness. And that's probably the best way I can uh, put equity. Equity is fairness. In the legal context, I'm, I'm actually defining equity as I speak now, um, which I'll finish off, and you should get a, a, an embodiment of what equity means. And, and I'll read the definition for you. Um, from Black's Law Dictionary. It says here, in its broadest and most general signification, the term denotes the spirit and the habit of fairness, justness and right dealing, which would regulate the intercourse of men and with men, the rule of doing to all others as we desire them to do to us, or as it is expressed 
by Justinian to live honestly, to harm nobody, to render every man his due. Uh, it is therefore the synonym, the synonym of natural right or justice, but in this sense its obligation is ethical rather than jury, jurial, jural, sorry. Okay, i read it again. It says, but in this sense its obligation is ethical rather than jural by a court, in other words, and its discussion belongs to the sphere of morals. It is grounded in the precepts of the conscience, not in any sanction of positive law. In the restricted sense, the word denotes equal and impartial justice, as between two persons whose rights or claims are in conflict. Justice, that is, um, as ascertained by natural reason or ethical insight, but independent of the formulated body of law. This is not the technical meaning of the term, except in so far as courts which administer equity seek to discover it by the agencies above mentioned or apply it beyond the strict lines of positive law. Um, so I hope that defines equity in, in a, a much deeper meaning. Effectively, it is fairness, okay? Um, so um, one man says that equity is behaving in such a way that is morally un upstanding. So hopefully the picture is now being um, presented in a, in a better light. So I, the question, I can understand how equity can fight your case, but doesn't the final decision lie with the judge or jury? The final decision lies with the judge, um, but you've got to understand uh, that the claimant or the beneficiary should always win. So provided you can, provided you can always prove your trust, there's no reason for you to lose in equity. So... And when we talk about litigation tomorrow, your job is to just limit a judge's discretion that his decisions are in favour of your argument. And so if you don't understand the law, you, you, you won't win. If you don't understand how to formulate a trust and prove a trust, you cannot win. If you can't understand how to get the court from common law into equity and invoke equity in its purest sense, uh, you can't be heard in court. So this is why I'm saying it's simple, but it's not easy. All right. So um, I hope that answers your question, Kenny. Uh, right. Okay. So, and let's continue with with this um, with this uh, text here because it's really important for for this for this evening. Um, where did I get to? Right, okay, so it says here, I'll just repeat, I might be a bit repetitive, but I apologise here. Um, the Chancellor eventually became the head of the, of his own court, known as the Court of Chancery, and it was here that equity developed as a branch of law, distinct from it at times in competition with the common law. The Court of Chancery came to be associated with, with discretionary, almost ad hoc justice, whereas the common law courts came to be associated with certain rigid and inflexible forms of action and remedy and in his speech in the Earl of Oxford's case which is a very powerful case okay it's back in 1615 now all right uh, Lord Chancellor Ellesmere observed that the office of the Chancellor is to correct men's consciences for frauds breaches of trust wrongs and oppressions of what nature soever they may be and to soften and mollify the extremity of the law in that case the Lord Chancellor was defending the Court of Chancery from the accusation made by a gentleman called um, Sir Edward Coke, who was then the Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench. Today we have a Queen, so it's called the Queen's Bench, which is the division of the common law today. Okay, Chancery is a division of equity in the High Court, and then King's, the Queen's Bench is the division of, uh, the, of, of common law today. Okay, So that it had illegally assumed the role of, of Court of Appeal over the common law courts. The Lord Chancellor's sophisticated response was to argue that he was not criticising common law judgments, but rather the conscience of the party seeking to enforce those judgments. Which is quite clear that the conscience of the judges we deal with today is not for your benefit at all. So equity will come, and when I go through the, the, the maxims, it will make more sense, but equity will come to your aid, providing you've done all that you're supposed to do. All right? So another question. So, so sorry, Richard. Was you quoting from Gary Watts' Trust and Equity book? That's correct. I am currently quoting from his book. And it's a phenomenal book. Uh, it's one of the best, better authors with regards to equity that I've come across. Um, it, is it inevitable to go to court when using trust, or can you use them and not get drawn into court battles? Depends on, on the part that you're dealing with. It really does depend on the part that you're dealing with. 
Um, to be honest, when I'm dealing with trusts today, um, I'm normally getting involved when it's already gone to court. Um, so effectively, um, if the examples I gave yesterday, um, it stopped court actions. All right. So, unfortunately, what I'm trying to say with I don't think it's not time for us to be afraid of court. Um, depending on your circumstances, not everyone on this, on this webinar has debt issues where it's going to court. But you got to understand. I mean, uh, just for some stupid water bill of two hundred pounds, they may try and put a charge in your home. They may try and take it to put a CCJ against you. Now, sometimes you can't avoid that. You just cannot avoid it. Now, you can, if you don't know, if you just come on a call and you have no clue about promissory notes or APVs, this, this is completely new to you, and you know you've got court cases pending because you've been in ignorance or silence or suffering and not knowing what to do, then we're going to have to get some action, to take some action and, and do something fast. Uh, if um, you've been in, you know, not taught by myself or whatever, I don't know, but you've just been rummaging around trying to find knowledge, information, uh, understanding to deal with these people wisely, and everything you've done in the past has just not worked, then um, if court is pending because they use court in, in, for, their, for their own gain at the end of the day, you, you're going to need to know how to fight that system. You, you can't really get away from it if you're going to be going down this journey. So either you stay in their world, pay their bills when they want you to pay, and that's fine, and you've got no problem with that. If, if you have a problem with that, then this is what this course is all about. We can't really negate it. Um, but just choose your fights. Pick your fights wisely. You know, if you're aware you can OID certain things, so maybe maybe you just want to pay certain things to OID. It. That's not a problem. There's certain things that you know, just for a matter of principle, you, you're going to have to get involved. Someone just takes you to court, no matter what you do. Um, you may not have sixty or hundred thousand pounds to pay somebody uh, before you can OID. It, so you're going to have to fight them. It just depends on what fights you're going to pick and what fights you're going to choose to to, to get involved with. Yeah. Um, what stopped court actions? I don't know if you were on the call yesterday, but I, 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 when I told my story, the very first trust I expressed, and that was a year ago, stopped um, counter tax harassment, it stopped a statutory demand for bankruptcy, and it stopped um, a county court judgment being made initially. So at that point, I realized, well, trusts work. So hence, I studied and studied and studied, and, and, and now I'm showing you why they, it does work. Um, there's there's a, there's not just an element of truth. It's not just um, you know people saying, "Well, I got this result as a one-off." Uh, it's it's repetitive. You can repeat this, um, and you can see why it works, which is the beauty of trust. You can see it because you can read it in their law books, you can read it in their statutes, you can read it in their in their in their policies in case law, and and you now have credible proof and information to 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 get justice, as long as you're prepared to fight. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Nana. Um, I'm not saying that just because you get involved with trust, it, you, 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 by default you get involved with court. But um, I deal with people who have court issues, and I, I deal with people who don't have court issues. You may just want to use trust to protect your assets, and that's it. You may want to use trust to to, to pay certain bills, and that's it. Um, but at least you know the end before you get into involved with the beginning. That's what I'm trying to say. And normally, because it involves a litigation stage, if you're winning pre-court, you're less likely to go to court um, if you've done what you're supposed to do correctly. Um, or they may try it on because they, they know that people don't like court because of the fear aspect, and that's why people just give up. So that's all I'm saying about it, really. It's not a matter of, well, we have to go to court. I'm just trying to teach you where this has stemmed from. All right, there's two bodies of law. Uh, the best learning place for this journey is court because more than likely they will test you, which is absolutely correct. I, I agree. Um, and most of my learning, unfortunately, has come from, uh, you know, when you come out of the courtroom and you review well, what just happened there and you realise, OK, I, I, I can see why. And it gets you thinking, it gets you researching, it gets you... And then you, I can now sh teach you because I've, I've been there, done that. Um, it's not just a matter of just sitting down and reading books for the sake of it. It doesn't work like that. Uh, in my experience. Um, so the book I'm reading from is, just, I'll, I'll write it down, um, just for those who've just joined the call. It's 
it's actually uh, it's got Todd and Watts uh, eighth edition. cases and materials on equity and trusts all right uh, but the author is actually Gary what okay so um, Right, I, I'll I'll have to um, that's a if you can send me a private email on that one, Carol, then I, we can uh, have a discussion on that one. I won't mention it on the group if that's okay. Um, just send me an email, we can have a discussion on that. Right, so moving forward, um, I'm going to finish this off before I answer any more questions now because um, time is going. But I'll, this part does. Uh, bear repeating so again in his speech uh, in the Earl of Oxford's case in 1615 uh, Lord Chancellor Ellesmere observed that the office of the Chancellor is to correct men's consciences for frauds breaches of trust wrongs and oppressions of what nature soever they may be and to soften and mollify the extremity of the law it says in that case the Lord Chancellor was defending the court of Chancellery from the accusation which is made by Sir Edward Coke, who was then the Chief Justice of the King's Bench, it had illegally assumed the role of court of appeal over the common law courts, and the Lord Chancellor's sophisticated response was to argue that he was not criticising common law judgments, but rather the conscience of the party seeking to enforce those judgments. When a judgment is obtained by oppression, by wrong, and of hard conscience, the Chancellor will frustrate and set it aside. Okay? not for any error or defect in the judgment itself, but for the hard conscience of the party. It just reminds you of the scripture of Luke 18 with the unjust judge. The woman just kept him, you know, he, he was hard, he, he didn't fear man nor God, the Bible says. And yet so this woman got her justice because she was persistent with him, that he favoured her. Now this is the same, same thing, it's the exact, same, the exact same thing as far as I'm concerned. Equity will come into the fore. All right, and then that scripture goes on to say, men should ought to pray and not to faint. And if you understand the definition of prayer, it just means petitioning to God for him to come into your aid. So the same thing here, equity will come to your aid if you allow it to. So you've got to understand what this is all about. I'll give you a modern example of equity. I think it was Ryan Giggs um, must have had some affair or something like that. And this girl was about to go on, on, on the paper and, and uh, reveal all. And he effectively gets a gagging order against her. He effectively goes to court and um, gets an injunction to stop her from talking. And the news on TV is saying, no, I can't believe these things still work today. What do you think Ryan Giggs went and done? Do you think it was a regular court that just gave a judgment? No, an injunction is equity. And to prevent his, or pre preserve his rights or, pre or prevent a wrong from happening, yeah, for his, even if he, he was right or wrong, it's still his private affairs. And so he got an injunction. Equity now prevented her. If she violated those rights, she would be going to jail. There's as simple as that. That's just a modern example of how equity will come to your aid. Now, okay, fine, he's got the money to, to, to invest in the expensive barrister to do it quickly, but there's nothing stopping you from learning and applying the same thing. All right? Um, right, some questions have come up. Let me, if I'm going to finish this, I'm going to finish reading this and I'll answer the questions. I have to because I know I'm going to not ever get it done. Right, so. Um, right, the disputes. The dispute between Sir Edward Coke and Lord Chancellor Ellesmere was referred to King James I, the one who wrote the King James Bible, by the way, okay? And the king who patronised, uh, patronised rather, not patronised, who patronised the Bible translator quoted earlier in 1616. Uh, king James decided in favour of the Chancellor and thereby established the rule that whenever equity and law conflict, who would prevail? Uh, uh, equity shall prevail. Equity will have the, pr the presidents. Equity shall lead. Equity is in control. Why? Because the king wanted to reserve his right 
for having a conscience and not allowing any law to subvert his power conveyed to him by God himself. That's how, that's how powerful equity is. But most people don't actually understand that. I'll read it again. The dispute between Sir Edward Coke and Lord Chancellor Ellesmere was referred to King James I, the king who pat patronised the Bible translation quoted earlier. In 1616, okay, King James decided in favour of the Chancellor and thereby established a rule, which we now know as a maxim, okay, that whenever equity and law conflict, equity will prevail. A few years earlier, Shakespeare had set a similar scene before King Lear in the eponymous uh, play. To Edgar, the king says, Thou robed man of justice, take thy place. And this suggests the office of Lord Chief Justice. Um, to the fool, he says, And thou, his yoke fellow of equity, bench by his side, this clearly indicates the Lord Chancellor and then William Shakespeare in King Lear and that's Act number 3, Scene 6. So this scene, which appears in the 1608 quarto edition of the play, was omitted from the 1623 first folio edition. This guy's gone deep into his research. They don't want you to know this stuff. He says the omission is probably attribu attributable to the fact that the relationship between law and equity had become so politically contentious around that time of the Earl of Oxford's case in 1615. So I want to stop there, but um, just a quick, a quick point here is that equity necessarily um, has a place in any just system of law and is not exclusively an English idea. Nevertheless, it is only in England with its peculiar jurisdictional distinction between the courts of common law and the court of chancery that equity enjoyed, or depending upon one's point of view, endured gradual refinement into a distinct body of law that has survived until the present day, and I say endured because the process of developing equity in the special court of a chancery was a long and painful one, and by the start of the 18th century the court of chancery was hopelessly overworked and inefficient. To the appointment in 1729 of the chief chancery master, the master of the rolls, okay, to sit as a second judge hardly helped mainly because the Chancellor remained the only judge able to hear appeals, and in 1813 a Vice-Chancellor was appointed, but even that did not improve matters much. There were now three judges presiding in Chancery, where once there had been the Chancellor alone, now there were three judges. It says, yet when Sir Lancelot um, Shadwell was asked whether the three judges could cope, he is said to have replied, no, not three angels. And the Court of Chancery Act 1851 was an early attempt to wrestle with the procedural problems in the Court of Chancery. Now, I'm reading this because this is vitally important for you to understand. It, says, it was during 1851, when the newspapers were full of talk of Chancery reform, etc., that Charles Dickens wrote his great literary complaint against Chancery, which is called the Bleak House. But the Court of Chancery and the Common Law Courts were subsequently fused as a single Supreme Court by the Judicator Acts of 1873. Now, I've, I've said that because this is going to lead you into enforcement and also lead you into, for tomorrow's um, uh, webinar, where we talk about litigation. Right now, you've got one court, which is the High Court, and all the rules, because it used to be two separate courts. There used to be a separate court of chancery, where it is today, and the, the bench, the Queen's bench, or King's bench, was in Westminster. Sorry, other way around. Chancery was in Westminster and the Queen's Bench or King's Bench was in where it is today in, in, in um, the Strand. And they joined both bodies together. It's in the one court today. Um, and the, the, the rules to get into equity as well as the rules to get into the common law were fused and merged into one, which we now know as the CPR rules. Okay, So you need to understand that equity is there for your aid. But if you don't know how to find it or invoke it, um, it will not come to your rescue. All right? Um, and that, I just wanted to read that for an introduction for, and to tell you now uh, that equity uh, exists. Equity is the law that governs trust. Uh, and you have no um, say as a beneficiary, especially when you go to a regular court, if you go to a regular court. Now let's look at, I'm not going to talk about anything more about court, hopefully today, I'm going to more about that tomorrow. Today now is 
Why is equity so powerful and how do you enforce your trust? Well, we're going to look at now what we call maxims. And there is 12 principal what we call core maxims. And I'll read them out to you. Uh, have we got, oh, I'm going to read these questions first. Um, was just looking at the book in Blackwell's today. Okay. Uh, what is your Skype group? Um, I'm not too sure about that question, Agnes. Uh, if you've already done one of the trust courses, which of these new ones should one do? Um, it will be enforcement, and the last one is the uh, litigation. All right. Uh, the quote regarding Shakespeare is in the Todd and Watts book that you've got written up now. That's correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah. So, um, Heather, just you just come back. Just to answer your question. Um, it's, it's the enforcement course and the, the litigation course that you'll be interested in if you've done the basic one already. All right. Um, right now, maxims of law. Maxims of law. I'm going to read them out and I'll try and write them out as well. There's... There's 12 core, I've got 19 here, but there's 12 core maxims. Um, and I'm going to go through, I'm not going to explain it into too much depth because that, that will take a long time and I might even start preaching, which I don't want to do. Um, but I'm just going to let you know that, the, that your comfort in enforcing your trusts lies in these maxims, okay? Um, and, and the maxims is known as uh, legum legis, all right? Uh, the law of the laws, yeah? It's the, it's the principle. It supersedes any statute. In fact, they couldn't introduce bills, acts, and statute without equity. Just, that's why you have to vote. It's as simple as that. Now, number one, equity regards in what ought to be done, okay? Re equity regards what ought to be done. Equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. Just those two maxims alone is the principle of all equity, to be fair. Okay, equity delights in equality. One who seeks equity must do equity. One who seeks equity must do equity. Equity aids the vigilant. This is my favourite one because it affects me the most. Equity aids the vigilant and not those who slumber or sleep on their rights. Yeah, it's as simple as that. It will aid the vigilant, those who are uh, per persistent, those who are looking for justice. It will come to your aid. And not those who sleep or slumber on their rights, okay? And gives up and quits easily. Equity imputes an intent to fulfill an obligation. This is where your trustees will be, will, will be uh, scared. Because it will, to what the word impute means it will make you, it will force you, it will enjoin you, yeah? And compel you to act in order to fulfill the office that you are obliged to perform. Equity acts in personam, not in rem. What does I mean? Has anyone heard of these two terms? In rem and in personam. Has anyone not heard of these terms before? Would you like me to explain them in a little bit more detail? Type a Y if you can. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's a few years just coming up here. So... Um, in rem uh, is Latin for um, against a thing. Okay, so when you go to court in common law, what do they do? They pass judgment against you to do something, normally to pay out money. And if you don't pay out money, they're coming against not you, but your things. They'll take your house, they put a charge against your house, they'll take your car, they'll clamp your car, they'll do all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, that's effectively what uh, in rem means, yeah? Whereas in personam is they don't care about what you you own or your straw man own, they're coming after you. That means jail time. If you don't do what they've ordered you to do in personam. So a trustee who is in breach or is not performed and is found guilty of that and that's why typically when you go to court as a defendant if you haven't paid that's it you're guilty though they don't care about anything else uh they're coming after inequity and they're coming after you all right and that that means jail time if you don't fulfill the order 
so that's in equity acts in personam all right it's and plus the reason why i'm saying that is it's only you or a man um when i say a man a, a real living person uh has a conscience to to deal with yeah only they can act unconscionably sorry unconscionably towards you or not so equity has to correct that unconscionable nature to be conscionable so it only can work against the person and not the thing it has to compel the person to perform and that's why it says equity regarding what ought to be done it reverts back to that yeah um so equity abhors a forfeiture All right number nine equity does not require an idle gesture number ten one who comes into equity must come with clean hands and then the the the, the common law uh opposite to that is um the unclean hands doctrine so they're two separate things okay um, so equity delights to do justice and not by halves equity will take jurisdiction over a multiplicity of suits so if you've got a multiplicity of actions going on equity will just look at the whole thing and just make one decision it's not going to allow certain uh, multiple suits to go on um, and not deal with the problem it will deal with the problem okay uh, equity follows the law uh, equity that's a that's i'm not even explaining equity follows the law that's a whole that's just that's it's not it's not how it sounds in other words okay Equity will only follow the law if the law is correct if the law is operating um unconscionably towards you equity will take a president and correct the wrong equity will not aid a volunteer in other words if you're not operating in trust it, will, it doesn't want anything to do with you um you're you're, you're back in common law uh, number 15 here it says between equal equities the law will prevail um number 16 between equal equities the first in order of time shall prevail okay equity will not complete an imperfect gift um which is not really a, 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 the truest form of maxim um but it's, it's on here anyway number 18 equity will not allow a statute to be used as a cloak of fraud that's very powerful they're hiding behind all these statutes to, to, to justify things and it says it will not allow a statute to be used as a cloak of fraud all right and number 19 equity will not allow a trust to fail for want of a trustee so i've got a couple of questions explain clean hands okay and what was the one before equity follows the law please equity will take jurisdiction to avoid a multiplicity of suits all right so clean hands uh explain clean hands right okay in other words it, 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 equity um what's the easiest way i can explain clean hands equity uh, one who comes to equity must come with clean hands is in my mind the same as he who seeks equity must do equity if you've entered into a contract that states you must pay and you haven't paid you haven't um and yes you're going to equity for help you you've you've violated the rules so equity is not going to come to your aid if you haven't paid because you've promised that you would pay that's the contract so you can't so you must come into equity with clean hands so in other words you must have done everything that you can do in your power in common law so that if common law is still dealing you a bad time or a hard blow equity will see that well, you have been equitable so i can so equity will come to your aid all right there's a there's quite a few parables there's one on here where it says he who sees equity must do equity matthew seven twelve. therefore whatever you want men to do to you do also to them which is putting it bluntly all right um and then where's the, the other one was um uh, there's a parable of the, of the creditor and his and his um his aide or his servant uh not not his servant but basically someone came to the creditor to ask him pleading for mercy i can't pay the debt i can't pay the debt please have mercy please give me give me some more time so the creditor ha had favor upon this guy and said fine no problem um i won't put you in prison you can have more time to pay the debt but then this some other debtor came to that same person who was now relinquished of his debt okay asking for mercy but he didn't deal with the same blow he said no you're going straight to prison so the creditor goes to this guy look i'll give you favor i'll give you more time and yet so the same guy who got the favor someone else asked him for help and he refused it 
So the creditor came back to the guy and put him in prison because he, he who was seeking equity was not doing equity. He had unclean hands. So the question now, but if the other side has less clean hands, are you equitable? Well, it's not about the other side, it's about you. If Have you fulfilled what you said you're going to do? Have you fulfilled everything you're supposed to do? Equity will come to your aid. All right? So that's how I see it. So if they're dealing a the bad blow against you, that's fine. But the question is, if you want equity to come to your aid, have you done everything that you're supposed to do? Else it can't come to your aid. So uh, um, that's the equitable part. Uh, in common law, it's that you know the, um, you can't come in with unclean hands, so it's just a, a kind of a balanced type of thing. Have you paid the debt, etc.? That's why when we talk about the trust yesterday, yeah, the, the trust has paid the debt. The trust has paid the debt. Now the the question is only in equity will that be will it be recognised if the trustees have not performed their duties? So long as you've done your part, then that's fine. But if you haven't fulfilled the, this is the same thing with in, in when I say DC or debtor creditor world, it's the same thing. You know, we're there arguing and saying, well, prove the debt, validate the debt. Well, that's just that's a that's a worthless argument to get into. You're never going to win that argument. You're better off saying, well, look, I paid you now, and the whole f script has now flipped across because they can't define what payment is to you. All you know is you fulfilled the obligation. They can't tell you what species of money to pay in because there is no law to determine what species of money to pay with, and plus there's no money anyway. So therefore, you're in, you've got the upper hand. You've got the upper hand, and you fulfilled your part of the deal. You've paid, so equity should come to your aid. All right. So that's why you've got clean hands because you've done everything you're supposed to do. So he who seeks equity must do equity, and that does, that is that is the underlying statement for he who comes into equity must come with clean hands. So you're not you're not acting unconscionably towards your um, adversaries. That's why Jesus said, "Love your enemies." Yeah, because even though it seems like an oxymoron, he's just saying, look, it's the one thing for them to give you a bad time, but if you're going to give them a bad time, then how can I come in and give you justice? It doesn't work that way. So I hope that explains it. Um, that's the best I can do for a very, very short space of time. But if you haven't met your bills and incurred a debt, don't you have unclean hands? Exactly, you do. But if you've expressed the trust and paid the debt, then your hands are now technically clean once you prove the trust or if you've used other methods in the past which you know pre-trust methods again you fulfilled your obligation that's 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 what i'm trying to make pay the debt pay it off all i'm saying is you don't have to use your hard-earned labor and cash to pay it with all right so i hope that answers your question kenny okay so these are the equitable maxims and this is what we use to enforce the trust. In it, because you, you effectively equity will come to your aid. Um, what I want to do now is give draw your attention to certain situations where equity will be invoked, and then we're going to just close by talking about um, the, the 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 types of equity. And it might sound a bit confusing, but there are actually uh, two distinct types of equity. And you need to know what 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 side of the fence you're standing on. Okay, um, so. Let me just um, get the correct. Right, here we go. It's just helping everyone, by the way. Is this, is this okay? No one's not falling asleep or switched off or anything like that. Is this um, within your expectation or is it superseding your expectation or is anyone indifferent? Is this helping? Okay, cool. Right, so um, I'm now reading from uh, a gentleman called um, Henry Gibson, um, a treatise on suits in chancery. This is one of the, of the books that we use in the enforcement side of things. Um, well, in fact, from yeah, from enforcement and litigation. Um, huge book, uh, but there's a section here which I want to read out now, called The 33 Children of Equity. And what I find really exciting about this is that when I read this and understand these proponents of equity, you know, hundreds and two hundred years ago, especially in the States where they brought over the UK law, and so it's, 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 it's almost repeated from what we're seeing in, in the UK itself. Um, it, well, now when you read their rules, it's purely equitable. 
everything i know it might sound like a joke but it is actually purely equitable if you read the, their law books you know the, the, the green book you read cpr rules you understand what they're trying to achieve even something like pre-action protocols in the courtroom um or and you look at that it's purely equitable um the doctrine of notice is purely equitable the doctrine of um evidence and specific performance to compel evidence to be produced this is simple um giving a defense to a claim and then expecting the reply to your defense or a counterclaim all of this is purely on an equitable nature and they're just using it against you but in a general form so all we've got to learn to do is recognize equity we, we talk about opening your equitable eyes now seeing what they're trying to do against you and then stopping it or subverting it uh, or countering it with your own attack um the the the, the whole premise of equity is unlike anything I've experienced before because normally I'm on a defense if I'm in the debt to creditor world you know they're making a, a accusation against me and I'm just trying to, to push them away and leave them leave me alone in equity you are actually bringing the fight to them you're the one who now saying look I've had enough and I'm going to come after you so you better get ready and it's, believe it or not who do you think in a trust relationship is the one that brings the fight out of the three characters in the in the role It'll be interesting because some of you have not, some of you may have been in my courses, but most of you there's about thirty of people on the course tonight. Um, so let's be, be interested to find out your understanding of what I've said so far. Out of the three roles, the settlor, the trustee, and the beneficiary, who do you think is the one that brings the fight to prove a trust and to and to compel someone to 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 act? So I've got one answer. I'm just if you can all type something, okay. So some saying the trustee, some saying the beneficiary. Anyone else wants to attempt to answer? Okay, right. So m most people are saying the beneficiary. So that's so obviously people got um, some uh, background of trust, which is good. Um, but the, the, or declines. Who responds? Okay, uh, Dory, could you just repeat the question? So Benny. But when the trustee disclaims or declines, who responds? Well, if if for the disclaimer, the the, the trust the trust has invested. If the trust has invested, then the settlor is still in the picture. So it's the settlor that will make sure the trust is vested. Once the trust is vested, if the trustee if the trustee is not performing, the one who compels the trustee to perform is the beneficiary. All right, the beneficiary is the one who compels the trustee to perform. If the trustee is disclaimed, it means that the trustee is not actually in, is not vested yet. So it's a set law he will compel. And remember, a trust will not fail for lack of a trustee. So, but you don't want the court to get involved with your trust. So you, you will find a trustee. Um, so the trust is vested, but trust denies who, who the beneficiary is the one who enforces or the trustee depending on the, on the setup. So if you've got multiple trustees and one of them has a good conscience and sees that the others are not behaving themselves, then that one can compel or the beneficiary brings it in to court. However, the beneficiary cannot be heard in common law because he hasn't got no legal status. He only has real equitable status. So he only can be heard in equity. He has an equitable claim. And those are very powerful words, equitable claim. And uh, by the way, a county court can hear equitable matters up to £30,000. So you can invoke a court of equity at any time. But we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, let me not get uh, dis distracted too much here. So I want to just um, talk to you about uh, the 33 children of equity. So it will open your eyes as to you, you have equitable rights. This may start to um, be quite eye-opening for most of you here. Uh, and again, all of these are surmised in the CPR rules. All right? Just to let you know. It's in their statutes and acts. It's all, you know, coded. It's all uh, uh, codified and hidden. But it's all there. And they are very distinct to the, to the, you know, when they talk about legal aspects and lawful aspects. They don't mince their words at all. So a quick question. Would equity be on your side in a student? And in any case. But let me read these 33 children and you'll understand, okay? Um, okay, the equitable or inherent jurisdiction of the Chancery Court includes all cases of an equitable nature 
where the debt or demand ex now this is an old document it says it exceeds fifty dollars but this now just assume it exceeds any amount all right and these cases include the following number one all suits resulting from accidents and mistakes number two all suits resulting from frauds actual and constructive number three all suits resulting from trust express constructive and resulting all suits for the specific performance of contracts all suits for the ref reformation, re-execution, rescission, and surrender of written instruments. Okay, all suits for an accounting or for surcharging and falsifying accounts. All suits for partners and to wind up an insolvent partnership. All suits for administration and marketing of assets. All suits for subrogation and substitution, which is basically insurance. All suits for the enforcement of liens created by mortgages, deeds of trust, sales of lands on credit or other equitable considerations, all suits by married women against their husbands except for divorce, all suits against married women and minors in reference to their estates not cognizable at law, common law, yeah, all suits by, by wards against guardians, uh, wards against guardians, that's the straw man, okay, guardian ward relationship, um, executors, administrators, just turn the page here, sorry, uh, and others where an accounting or surcharging or falsifying an account is necessary. All suits for the apportionment and, con and contribution. Um, all suits for the marketing of securities. All suits for relief against forfeitures and penalties. Yes? All suits for the redemption of land or other properties. So all mortgage, prop all mortgage cases are equitable ones, by the way. Um, all bankruptcy cases are in equity. Okay? Governed under chancery. Um... All suits to have absolute deeds or bills of sales declared to be mortgages. All suits for the construction and enforcement of wills and trusts. All suits to obtain a set obtain a set off against a judgment in favour of a non-resident or insolvent. All suits for the discovery or perpetuation of testimony. All right, discovery is equitable. Has anyone heard of discovery before? You know, discovering the truth, what actually happened. Yeah, just by writing your proofs of claims is discovery. You'll get in the evidence, but we'll talk about more of that tomorrow. Um, it says here, all suits to compel complaints to interplead. All suits for equitable attachments and receivers. Okay, that's with LPA receivers. All suits where um, a knee exact republican, that's a type of, uh, of injunction, is sought. All suits where an injunction is a substantial part of the relief sought. All suits to remove clouds and quiet titles. All suits for the establishment and All suits for the establishment and execution of charities. All suits of a new trial after a judgment at law. All suits to have void judgments so declared and to avoid voidable judgments. All suits to execute decrees and to impeach decrees and judgments. All suits to prevent the doing of an illegal or inequitable act to the injury of complainant's property rights. Of interest okay all suits for the exoneration or protection of sureties and number 33 is all other suits where the defendant has done or is doing or is threatening to do some inequitable acts to the injury of the complainant and there is no adequate remedy thereafter in any other court so to answer your question equity will be at your aid for pretty much any uh, commercial situation that you will find yourself in today or should I say your straw man will find itself in today. So you need to understand um, that yes, trust is very powerful, but you also need to understand why you're establishing them and how to enforce it. And so with the maxims, you are you now, it opens a door, doorway to say, well, yes, I'm going to enforce my rights because you have rights. Remember, he who is, um, equity only aids the vigilant and not those who sleep on their rights. So once you understand that you have rights, you've got to do something about it, and equity will come to your aid. And so that's the, that's the crux of enforcement. So once you understand that you are in equity, now there is a difference between um, when you go to the county court, yes, they're operating in equity against you, but it's stuff that they've made up. It's all constructive, all right? We talked about construed trust. Everything's pretty much a construed trust. The fact that you've got a straw man is constructive um, until you express what you want to see. Remember, you are the owner of everything. Okay? You you rule. You own. Uh, as real men and women, you are the possessors of this, this earth. 
okay um and so therefore it's your responsibility to be aware of your rights and no one can re tell you because you've already been told so what you got to understand is now that someone said something to you i've noticed you of your rights the question is are you going to get up and find out what they are or are you going to say oh no not to worry oh, too not too you know too bad it's already been done I'll, I'll let them just have their way and i'll just fit into the system like a glove and 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 live at peace well that's fine but you won't be living at peace for, for that much longer trust me um so you might as well fight for, for your freedom now rather than waiting until it's too late so all i'm trying to say to you is this as a set lawyer as the real man you have rights um i'm trying to help you establish what they are um you you need to own this information as best as possible so you can apply it um you can utilize this for pretty much any situation or circumstance i can't say here say here make guarantees i'm not in that position to be making you guarantees the only thing i can guarantee is that equity is real and it works trusts are real and it works so the only thing that limits the, 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 you from your um from where you are now to victory to what you want to be is just what you know and your ability to apply it um and and the only way you're going to get to do that is by studying and getting knowledge and, and getting to a place where you can accelerate your learning to, to to deal with these people fast and and quickly but what i love about trust is that i'm reading all these books i've got around me are just law books their law books which i can read and, and and open my eyes of understanding um so that i can see what's going on and use it against them and they have to shut up because it's it's in writing and this is what I never understood before early on in my journey. You used to go there and talk and talk and talk in the courtroom and now just make up their stories. And we were thinking, hang on a minute, the judge is just railroading me. He's just doing what he wants to do. He's doing it because he can. But you can limit that once you, once you know who you are. That's, that's the beauty of it all. So um, there is... What I want to close with now is... You have to be in what we call exclusive an exclusive uh, jurisdiction all right what the book would call inherent jurisdiction so if you haven't been able to keep up with your bills would that mean that under the maxim about dirty hands or clean hands rather you can no longer receive equity I'm saying equity won't come to your aid unless you have done something that's equitable. Um, it's uh, let me let me let me um, answer it like this because it's not here to to make people feel that they're in some form of uh, persecution or under subjection or they've lost hope. Because I've just said that equity aids the vigilant. So let's let's let's. Um, I want to read something to you and hopefully this might make life a lot easier. If you just bear with me for two seconds. Um, where are we now? Sorry about the sign, it just uh, came to me. Basically, I wanted to read something. I'm just trying to find it to read it to you. No, it's not. Okay, I'll have to just um, tell the story from my own point of view. There's this, uh, a, a scripture which I wanted to read out, but effectively, um, it was time for Peter to pay the tax in the Roman system. Okay, bear in mind that we're in a Roman system today. And so the, the, the tax collector says to Peter, you know, do, does your master, Jesus, pay taxes? So uh, effectively, Jesus says, uh, overhears a conversation and even before Peter enters, enters into the room where Jesus was situated, Jesus asks Peter a question, and I'll, I'll read it out here. Um, I'm reading from Matthew 17. Um, 
and I'm going to start the story. So it says, uh, when they were going about here to here and there in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be turned over uh, into the hands of men. And then verse 23 says, and, and they will kill him and he will be raised to life again on the third day. And they were deeply and exceedingly grieved and distressed. Now, when they arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel, um, which is a temple tax, went up to Peter and said, does not your teacher pay the half shekel, which is the tax? And he answered, this is Peter, yes. Um, and when he, when he came home, Jesus spoke to him, that's Jesus spoke to Peter about it first, saying, what do you think, Simon Peter? From whom do earthly rulers collect duties or tribute? All right, or collect taxes, okay? From their own sons or from others not of their own family? And then verse 26 says, and, then, and when Peter said, from other people not of their own family, Jesus said, to, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. All right? So let me read it from a, a, the King James translation. I'm reading from the Amplified just there. But the King James one says like this. It says, Peter said unto him, of strangers. So, verse 25. And he said, yes. And when he, and when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, from, prevented him saying, and it says, what thinkest thou, Simon Peter, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute or tax? Of their own children or from strangers, right? Now notice, kings of the earth are you and I, the real men, the real women, men and women, okay? Not these the straw men. The kings of the earth are you and I. Who is the one who's supposed to be paying taxes? The family members of the kings of the earth or the sons, yeah? Or the strangers, the one who's outside the family? Then Peter said unto him, of strangers, uh, Jesus, said, Jesus said unto him, then are the children the free? Uh, then are the children free? Okay, in other words, the children are free from paying any tribute or taxes at all. But then he says, notwithstanding, okay, or he says, however, in order not to give offence and cause them to stumble, that is to cause them to judge unfavourably and unjustly, he says, go down to the sea and throw in a hook, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find there a shekel, which is of, 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 of silver. Take it and give it to them and pay the temple tax for me and for yourself. So the, the full chapter is Matthew chapter 17. Okay. Starting from verse 23 down to 27. All right. Now, the point I'm trying to make to you is this. You are the son's of or the kings of the earth all right and you are exempt from tax that's why it's called a, te a tax re return because the tax is supposed to return to you and i now if you go on the oid course i'll explain this in more detail but effectively you are the source of all the credit you are the source of all of the energy of all of the 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 the, 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 the um the, the money that's going on around in this this world and so therefore that can only be done today because of a trust. And 99.99% of the population do not know what relationship they are in. Okay? Even though the relationship has been corrected. If you don't know, in other words, if, you, if you're not vigilant, you sleep on your rights and you have none. So the point I'm trying to make is you are the sons of this earth or you are the kings of this earth. So you're not technically supposed to pay anything. But he says, lest they be offended. So irrespective of what the situation is, just pay it. So you are going to be acting equitably. Now, what I've just explained, if you are in arrears, if you have issues, problems or whatever, I'm not saying you have to physically pay with cash. All right. In some circumstances, you may want to because they may want to take your house and you're just going to have to, you know, um, lose the, this particular battle and, and, and live to fight and win the war. All I'm trying to say is, You've got options, you've got access to value, you've got a promissory note. There's pretty much the two main ways of making payments outside of um, paying, uh, using the trust to make a payment, which is what we're talking about on this course, all right? So once you have paid and you can prove it, then you are in honour. And as far as you're concerned, you are, in, as far as I'm concerned, you have clean hands. I hope I've made the point. You're just doing what you're supposed to do and to, to, to stop any offence from being made. Now, it's these people who are coming against you who are acting unconscionably because if you've fulfilled the obligation 
and they can't provide proof why you shouldn't pay with the methods that you have paid with, then it's no different to the example I've told you about where if you give me um, £10 too much change and I don't say anything or use their example, keep sending you har harassment letters, keep sending bailiffs to your home and keep causing you grief and um, messing up your credit file and all that stuff, um, that they are acting unconscionably towards you. It's as simple as that. So therefore, equity is there to correct the wrong because as I read out in the, in the maxim, which is a guide to your ability to enforce, equity will not allow a wrong without a remedy. And there are multiple remedies or, or what we call equitable reliefs which I'll talk about more tomorrow, in inequity. It will relieve you from the burden, from the pressure, from the pain. You get relief in equity, you get um, 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 remedies at law. All right, so I hope that answers your question, um, whoever asked it earlier. Now, the next question here says... Um, yeah, so, Kenny, did that answer your question? I hope that... You know, it's it's just breaking it down as as as, as best I can really. As if you haven't made payment, you're gonna have to pay them. You're gonna have to learn about A for V and all this stuff, and you're gonna have to start to effect payment and do what you're supposed to do. That's our part of this bargain in this fictional world that we live in. It's as simple as that, and stand on it. So the next one says what? Okay, so just to clarify. Uh, the, what the actual trust is, is it fair to say that it is the straw man of finance? It's a fictitious person trust who is liable to foot the the bill based on operating in in a bankruptcy. Pretty much so, that's correct. It's a straw man who is the, 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 the company, the conduit, the vehicle operating in this fiction because we're too powerful to operate in it. But they're attaching everything to the straw man so you're going to have to correct those records. And the trust is the most powerful way of doing that. Okay? So, um, is that okay for everyone? Just type a why if that's, if I've not lost anyone at this point. No one's cut off the call, which is great. So, um, it seems like it's, it's working okay. Uh, right, so, um, thank you for that. Thank you for your answer. So, that's fine. So, now, now um, just to, as I was finishing off, uh, we have to operate in the equitable jurisdiction. This is where the relief will come, and they don't want you to operate in that world. Solicitors are not trained. I mean, it's only the high-paying ones that would have any kind of idea about about trusts, but they're all versed in, in the at-law side of things um, that they can't deal with your trusts, and they don't want to receive your trusts. Um, and when you know what you're talking about, um, they may try to um, pick holes and call it peculiar and uh, incomprehensible but they're just playing games because they know what's going on and they're just trying to um as my mum would say play fool to catch wise yeah you, they're just trying to play dumb well, well you got to see through that all right you just got to see straight through that um and and you got to be, be vigilant and be sober um I, I, since i'm on the scriptures i can read another one so you can uh there's two there's there's john 10 chapter 10 and it says that the thief he comes to steal to kill and destroy yeah, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but Jesus says that he's come that you should have life and have it in abundance. So that's what I'm standing for. Why shouldn't you have it in abundance? And then um, 1 Peter 5 and 8 says it like this, be vigilant and be sober because there's an enemy who's out there uh, who is looking to devour you like a roaring lion. He will not sleep. He will not sleep. He's just trying to make your life a complete misery. So once you, you're wide awake and you know what's going on, um, unfortunately, you know, you might call it karma, you might call it whatever. Uh, it's not. It's basically um, you, your eyes are now opened, and you've got you've got to fight. You've got to to, to stay above the parapet, so to speak. You're going to have to be be um, able to protect yourself financially, um, and and trust is certainly a, a very powerful way of doing that. Um, could that and, and another way to prove it is why do the rich use it all the time? Why is it you can go bankrupt tomorrow and still live like a king? Because if you understand trust, the whole point of it is, it's not the one who owns it all, it's the one who controls it all. And that's what trust, that's what trust is doing. It's the one who has the control, it's the one who's going to enjoy the benefits. So, if, you know, I remember there's a story that, um, I don't know if it's true, but Warren Buffett was telling how, uh, you know, he's supposed to be, well, he's a, he's a, a, a multiple billionaire, yeah, many times over. 
and someone wants to sue him because they're at a dinner party. You may have heard the story before. Um, and for some reason, his cat landed on, uh, was, was, was scared for some reason. And uh, when it jumped, it landed on someone's legs, a lady's legs, and it scratched her legs quite poorly or quite badly rather. So she wanted to sue him. So he's like, look, there's no point in you trying to sue me because I, I, you know, I don't have any money. I can't help you. There's nothing I can do. She didn't obviously believe him. So she wins the suit, obviously, but she can't get a penny from him. And why? Because nothing's in his name. Absolutely nothing is in his name. In fact, just a cat, <laughs> which obviously she didn't want to receive that as a nice gift, but nothing was in his name. So he had full control, but he didn't own. And so if you're not a trustee, they can't attach anything to you because you're not recognised in their fictional world. You want to be the beneficiary because you have equitable rights. But guess what? You know, you can't sue people um, for their goods and equity and you can compel them to perform in equity. So you want to reside in the land of equity. You, you know, when you buy your gold and silver, you want to put it in trust. When, you know, things that you, you say you have an attachment or ownership of today, you want to put it in trust. Or if you have property, even if it's mortgaged, um, you can protect the equitable side of things by you know, restricting people from putting their charges on there. Right, so that I'm just trying to tell you. Now, I'm just going to um, close uh, with one statement from a book, which, uh, again, is from Gary Watts. I'm kind of giving away all my kind of uh, trades. Well, not secrets, but what I would normally give out on the course. But, hey, you're here to learn, so so be it. Um, there's two quotes I want to read out to you. Um, the first one's on, on equitable remedies, okay, which is going to be a nice uh, precursor for t leading into tomorrow. It says that the purpose of equitable relief is to do more perfect and complete justice than would be achieved by leaving the parties to their routine remedies at common law. This means that where the common law remedy in, is monetary damages, for example, as, as it usually is, the court asks itself, is it just in all the circumstances that a plaintiff, that's the claimant, should be confined to his remedy in damages only, i.e. money? One situation in which common law damages will often be inadequate is where there has been a trespass to land or overhanging trees and overflying plains seldom can cause damage to landowners and even if a trespass occurs at ground level, there may be no damage beyond the bending of a few blades of grass underfoot. It is because the common law has no adequate general remedy to, for trespass that the court will usually award an injunction, there you go again, against the particular trespasser. So it's acting in persona, that's equity acting right there. The trespasser who re-enters the land in breach of the injunction does not breach a rule, but infringes a prohibition issued against the trespasser personally and may be fined or imprisoned for contempt of court. All right, so I just want to highlight, these are from law books I'm reading here, okay? And there's another one which might get your attention. Um, well, there's two more that I think might get your attention. This one's now between, it's called here, Public Example and Private Equity. All right? And it says, uh, Lord Justice James once held that the trustees' fiduciary duties, which include the duty not to make an unauthorised profit and to duty not to and a, sorry and the duty not to put oneself in a position of potential conflict with the trust must be strictly enforced for the safety of mankind so if your trust isn't performing it is your duty to compel them to perform you have to enforce your trusts the just the, this lord justice says here for the sake quote unquote for the safety of mankind if you want the reference it's parker versus mckenna 1874 all right and now fiduciary means monetary duties all right so once held that the trustee trustees monetary or fiduciary duties which include the duty not to make an unauthorized profit which what do you think they're doing against you all the time all right monetizing your money in the background okay because of the general relationship that we have got to correct all right so that's unauthorized profit and the duty not to put oneself in a position of potential conflict with the trust which, uh, must be strictly enforced for the safety of mankind. That's powerful words. And then finally, listen to this one. It says the English mortgage 
is a work of fiction and it is a fiction of, of the dishonest kind. It says, this was most apparent in the days when the mortgage operated by conveying the borrowers, which is the mortgage or fee simple, which is the we know as a low deal or full title, yeah, fee simple to the creditor mortgage, mortgagee until repayment of the debt, at which point the fee simple was redeemed by reconveyance back to the borrower. The conveyance expressed in the mortgage deed was one which we call long suppressio veri, right? Now, suppressio veri is Latin for concealment of truth yeah and also suggestio falsi which means a statement of uh, falsehood all right so it says here that the conveyance all right that conveyance expressed in the mortgage deed that one piece of paper which takes your property away from you right was one which is deemed as a concealment of truth and a statement of falsehood and that is quoted by justice maitland okay and in the in a book called uses and trusts all right so it's all in their work it's all in their, it's all in their writing okay and it says maitland attributed the falsehood to the action of equity but the legal deed of mortgage was inherently dishonest for it pretended to convey legal ownership when the parties merely intended to create security for the loan so you know and you continue to read that um, now, I wrote, this book is Equity Stirrings, okay? This is a book by Gary Watts. Again, as I said, this guy is a proponent of equity. I've not met many uh, legal practice, and he's a reader at um, Coventry, uh, no, uh, University of Warwick, okay? So, but he's a serious equity proponent, and this is like a, a, a real book, book of equity here um, called Equity Stirring. Right, the story of justice beyond law. Right, so I'm going to finish up now. I'm going to go to 11.30 like last night. We've hit two hours now. So where, where we are now, yesterday I discussed about uh, trusts and the law of trusts. Um, specifically to private trusts, express trusts. Um, I'm not sure uh, about that, that Plemon. Um, all I know, I've just got the ones that I've got. So I'm sure. I think the only one of the of the um, equity and trust should be fine because it's just really a new cover. So yeah, it should be fine. The, the context that is still the same the law you know the case law there's nothing new newer they're all pretty much you know 10 years and older so it should it should be fine um yesterday's uh i'm just the videos take a long time to um uh what's the word i want to use now to convert and then upload so hopefully by tomorrow they should be ready to for you to to review or to watch if you missed it yesterday so um, um, you need to kind of budget two and a half hours because I was talking for that long. Um, so sorry, so we discussed number one about trust. Now today we've talked about enforcement of trust and I hope you, you've opened your eyes a, a little bit into what we will learn. Um, obviously on these workshops I can tell you about um, what you can do on the courses. I'm going to show you how to do it, the practical steps so you, you can implement it immediately. Um, so um Tomorrow now we're going to look, look more into the litigation side of things, which is the court um, and how to prove your trust in the courtroom um, what, and what law supports that and also how to compel trustees to perform as well in equity. And then I'm going to basically, um, because the course dates have, are out, I think I sent an email yesterday, um, I've changed the dates because time's obviously going, so I've just given it an extra week. So the first private trust course, which is part one, uh, will be, I believe, I've put down for the end of um, the first week of April. That was the Easter weekend, I think it is, the Thursday and the Friday, um, which is this 5th and the 6th, I think, or the 6th and the 7th. I can't quite remember. And then the um, other course, which is the enforcement course, is the week after, and then the litigation course is the week after that. Um, both the private course is two days from 10 till 10, and the enforcement course is two days from 10 till 10. The litigation course... Um, it's also going to be two days from 10 till 10 plus um, 
some webinar support for the drafting side of things, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. So please don't miss tomorrow because it's vitally important. Um, the standard costs of these workshops, uh, I've had to increase the price because of my costs have gone up. So the standard cost is 695 per course for the two days. Um, however, tomorrow, if you're still on the call, um, even if you can't make it because you've registered, you've taken the time out, to, to, to take you know to listen to me you don't have to listen to me and thank you very much for making your time available to do so but because of that then um, I will be making it a very special offer uh, if you want to increase your learning I know there's some people from abroad um, who are on the call and so um, there'll be like uh, downloads of audios from previous courses that you can get access to with the paperwork perhaps if that's something that you might want to be interested in but um, either way I'll give you the option so if you can't make it tomorrow, don't worry, um, you will get the recording, I'll make the offer open for at least a day or two after the course tomorrow anyway. But the main thing is that you need to um, just stick it out till tomorrow if you can. I do appreciate your time, I do appreciate your attention, um, and the questions have been really great. I hope you are learning something new, I hope it is of extreme benefit to you, and it's not just um, you know listening to me in a soliloquy type, type of scenario. Um, um, yes, that I'll be discussing that tomorrow, Kenny. There will be um, a, a, an offer for all three courses for those who want to take it all up at once. So um, please come on tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll finish up tomorrow. It's Friday night, so hopefully I won't take two hours on a Friday night. You know, maybe we're going to be chilling out and, and leave, be with your, your family. But uh, I'll definitely make it worth your while. Um, and you can have access to these videos as well uh, for future reference. So thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, have a good night and I'll speak to you tomorrow uh, for the final part of this course. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it.